Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing, where our goal is to educate and debate specific stock investment ideas. Today, we are going to jump right into it. We're going to take a look at a company called Arc Resources, which is a Canadian intermediate oil and gas producer that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange and currently has a dividend yield of over 7%. So who cares? Well, first and foremost, it was recommended by a couple of our viewers. Um, Ruslan, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, uh, down below. He had asked for some analysis on ARC, as well as The Truth, uh, who was curious to see some additional Canadian energy names. So thank you both for, for putting in the request. Um, moreover, the sector's been beaten up over the last few years. We did a video previously on white cap, um, lower commodity prices, egress challenges in Canada, and the discount pricing that Canadian producers are taking to WTI. Add into that that recently the oil price has climbed back to the $60 range. In fact, a week or two ago rose as high as $65 amid the geopolitical concerns in Iran and the Middle East. Um, so I thought it actually be a pretty interesting time to take a look at another Canadian oil and gas producer. Uh, also, full respect to ARC, they have their own YouTube channel. I uh, encourage you to check it out. Uh, I believe they're around 50 subscribers, so it would be awesome if we got them a few extra subscribers uh, to their YouTube channel. As this video is going to take a look at ARC and see if it represents an attractive opportunity for investors. So let's dive in. Okay, so we'll start off with just the business overview and corporate summary. Uh, ARC operates in Alberta and BC. Okay, here's where their assets are, mostly in the Montney and the Cardium. And so you can see in the Montney, the average production is about 118 or 119,000 barrels a day, and the Cardium's a little over 10,000. So the Montney by far is their biggest play and represents the majority of their production. And that's this area up here on the map. Next thing I'll point out, they're proved and probable reserves, reserve life over 17 years. So in terms of their asset base and their reserve life, uh, they've got a lot. They've got a, land, a lot of land and a lot of potential uh, to develop over time. And then this is key, and we're gonna talk about this a lot today. Uh, one of the big differentiators for ARC relative to its other peers and, and white cap, again, the one that we profiled before, is ARC is heavy natural gas. So natural gas represents 74% of their production. So most of, most of its peers, the majority, and particularly with pricing right now, you're better off being in crude and liquids. Uh, ARC sort of got the opposite exposure. Its majority uh, majority of its production is coming from natural gas with some crude, you can see 21% here, and natural gas liquids 5% here. So that's going to be a big difference and we're going to talk about natural gas a fair bit in this presentation. Okay, looking at the share price, again, uh, brought the skier back, this time I went with the snowboarder. Um, it's been a, a, a slippery slope or a steep slope uh, for investors over the last five years. Stock's basically gone from $25 all the way down to $5. You can see here um, in the early fall of uh, 2019. It's popped back up recently, so it's trading at $7.71 recently. Um, currently, and that, that represents a price to funds from operation of 3.75 times. So the price to cash flow is still relatively low here. Um, and the dividend yield is 7.8%. Okay, let's jump into the financials quickly. And I wanted to highlight a few things uh, from the annual report over the last few years. I think first thing to note is um, historically the company has been profitable. So you can see here net income, little over 200 million in each of the last few years. In fact, close to 400 million in 2017. Um, so always a good sanity check for oil and gas producers. We know that um, as they, there's a big depreciation amount that is non-cash, non but you need to continue to find and explore and develop assets over time. So nice to see that historically they've been, been profitable. Uh, if we go further down, funds from operations of 819 million here in 2018, what you're going to notice is between the dividends and the capex, so the dividends of 212 million 
and the capital expenditures of 679 is its uh, payout ratio is over 100%. And a big part of that is ARC's been growing their production as opposed to some others who are just keeping it flat. Uh, but important to note as an investor that the dividend payout ratio is currently over 100% when you look at it on an all-in basis, including the capital expenditures. So the next slide, just to highlight that here a little bit more as a chart from the company's investor presentation, you can see CapEx being quite large historically. They're reducing their CapEx in 2020, and that's really to manage the dividend within their cash flow. At least that's what they're guiding to the market. And you can see the reward for all the CapEx that they've spent is production, uh, 1,000 barrels per day, is increasing from 133 in 2018 to 139 in 2019, and is expected to have a pretty large jump um, to 158,000 in 2020. Okay, uh, fast forward 2019, Q3 results are out, uh, so for the period ending September 2019, and important to note here, uh, they're no longer profitable. So based on the lower realized prices um, for their product, the, the actual the profitability has turned negative. So one thing I wanted to highlight here, I just put a little footnote, the net back, and we'll talk about net backs in a second, was $11.18 per barrel of oil equivalent in Q3 2019. That's really low. And here we go. Okay, so we'll talk about we'll talk about the net back, which is that sort of quick and dirty measure of how much cash flow does an oil and gas producer generate per barrel of oil. So you can see here, uh, just highlighting that um, natural gas pricing that they receive and they put it all together in a, a barrel of oil equivalent calculation. So they're getting crude oil pricing, $68.58. This is for 2018, by the way. Uh, then their condensate and their NGLs, they list the pricing uh, there as well. Natural gas, $2.37. Blend that all together, they get $28.12 in terms of pricing. Now recall with white cap, uh, and I put a little footnote down below, their realized prices were $56 a barrel. So you can see that that natural gas is really a drag on the total realized pricing. And uh, ARC talks a lot about in their, their investor presentation and their um, reporting that they're a low cost producer. And that uh, seems to be true, but they almost have to be. Uh, so when you've got uh, your realized pricing per barrel of oil of just $28, doesn't give you much room to work for work with. So the good news for ARC is they are a very low cost operator. But again, the weak gas pricing drives the reduced netbacks. And so you can see the netbacks here, uh, $13 to $15.70 to $17 in 2018. And that is uh, uh, lower on a year to date, year to date basis. So now let's take a look at the, uh, the big commodity exposure, natural gas. Um, this is a slide that they include, I uh, believe, in their investor presentation. And you can see here, one of the big takeaways is that uh, U.S. natural gas production between 2015 and 2019 has continued to increase. So it's, it's gone up significantly. And that's just not good, not good for the uh, supply demand dynamics. And you can see here pricing for natural gas. So we talked about uh, ARC getting a little over $2. Um, and historically, that gas had traded in sort of that $4, $4 plus range, uh, but it's really dropped down. In fact, just this past week, um, U.S. natural gas traded below $2. Um, so the quick takeaway is the oversupply or the increased uh, production has and continues to put significant downward pressure on pricing. Okay, so another slide here, this from ARC's perspective when they talk about the egress and demand outlook. Um, you can see most of their assets are here on the map, so I've just put the logo in so you can see it. 
there's the LNG Canada, which isn't built yet, but it's a liquefied natural gas facility that's expected to come online in 2024. We're going to talk about that in a minute or two. And then there's other routes that they can use to try and get their, their gas to different hubs and markets that are going to have, hopefully, uh, better pricing. And I think the, the point that the company's trying to make here is that in time, there's different dates here as to when um, egress is going to become available. But they're trying to, um, they're painting the picture that the, the story is going to improve over time. So while it might be difficult now, it should improve uh, in the coming years. And then just over in terms of the primary energy consumption outlook, um, this is uh, the source's BP Energy Outlook in 2019, but it does show uh, nat gas continuing to grow from a consumption perspective through to 2040. Okay, uh, so just how bad is natural gas situation, uh, particularly in the U.S.? Well, the rise of U.S. shale production has led to a large increase in gas flaring which is literally when they just burn off the gas, excuse me, from oil wells. This is an article from the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, called Oil Producers Are Setting Billions of Dollars on Fire. Uh, according to the World Bank, there was 5.1 trillion cubic feet uh, of natural gas that was flared globally in 2018, so just burned away. Often uh, it's an unwanted byproduct and not worth enough to sell. So the crude is uh, and the liquids are worth uh, are really what the producer is going for, and that's what's economic. And then that gas is just a byproduct, and the gas transportation infrastructure can be lacking, and the price can and has turned negative in certain areas. So uh, producers would rather resort to just flaring it than have to actually pay someone to uh, dispose of that gas. And so I think this is our last slide on natural gas. And I'm talking a lot about it, but this is the ARC story with three quarters of their production uh, gas weighted. And here is from their investor presentation and just talks about the pricing. And without, without spending too much time in on it, prices are low in the U.S. They're even lower in Canada. So you can see some market netbacks of $2, $1.86, $1.79 in the U.S. Up here in Canada... Uh, particularly around where ARC is operating, you've got netbacks of $0.48 cents and $0.89. Cents. So not, a, not, a, not an ideal environment to be operating in. Okay, uh, and, and here is what could hopefully really help them going forward. So a $40 billion liquefied natural gas project uh, includes a liquefaction plant in Kitimat, BC, and 670-kilometer pipeline. That was uh, the final investment decision was announced, I believe, um, a year ago. Five joint venture partners, including Shell, Mitsubishi, Petronas, PetroChina, and Korean Gas. And the the nuts and bolts of it are Asia has less natural gas supply historically and the realized prices are higher. Uh, so I think as of December 2019, prices for LNG uh, were over $5, um, $5 a cubic, uh, thousand cubic foot. So the, this is not here yet. Uh, the first shipments are expected in 2024 um, and 2025. But if it does uh, come through on time and uh, begins production, expect 2 billion cubic feet per day of capacity, then obviously the hope would be that realized prices are going to be increased meaningfully from, from their low levels today. And yeah, so when it's completed, it should provide a better egress for ARC's production and hopefully improve pricing. And then the last chart here before we get into key considerations, I thought this one was really interesting because the fact that they're three quarters in that gas, I would have thought that their funds from operations sensitivity would lean uh, more heavily towards changes in that gas. However, um, a 10% change in the crude oil price would actually be the biggest swing on FFO. And I think what that tells you is today, 
It's the liquids and the oil that are actually generating the cash flow to support the dividend and the capex. And so while natural gas is three quarters of the production, it most definitely isn't three quarters of the cash flow. So I thought that was interesting uh, to point out. Okay, key considerations for investors. Strengths. You know, I think ARC's put together a really strong asset base uh, and their experienced operators. Management team's been around for a long time. The uh, reserve life we talked about being 18 plus years. Uh, so that's really positive. Number two, they have a track record of profitability through weak commodity environments. We know that that's changed year to date. They've, they've dipped unprofitable, uh, but um, this group and this company has has operated through lean environment, uh, uh, commodity price environments in the past. They have low leverage net debt of about 1.2 times next year's FFO. Uh, so pretty pretty clean, not zero net debt, but, but pretty reasonable, pretty low leverage. And you get a dividend of seven plus percent while you wait. So the risks. Natural gas uh, oversupply and pricing dynamics. I think we had four slides on it. Um, it's not a great space to be in today. So I think you need to think that it's going to improve uh, going forward if, if you're a buyer of ARC. Number two, egress and timing on the LNG. So minimum four years away from actually seeing the benefit plus potential delays. Uh, so it may not finish on time. And then number three, the benefit of LNG could mostly accrue to the Shell JV. So even though there will be better egress for, for ARC from a pricing perspective, who's going to benefit the most between that arbitrage that currently exists between uh, Canadian pricing and what you'd be able to get uh, in Asia? Uh, and then here on number four, oil and liquids pricing. I think that's more of a near-term risk because it's driving the cash flow that's funding the dividend and the capex in the, in the near term. And lastly, unprofitable in, in the recent quarter and at these prices. Uh, so if, if these prices sustain, you know, if prices don't move upwards, it's it's uh, that's a risk to to ARC and and potentially the dividend if they stay if they stay there for for too long. Key drivers, uh, oil and liquids pricing in the near term. And that's, like I said, that's funding the dividend and sustaining CapEx. And then more in the medium to long term, it's, it's natural gas pricing. So the supply demand dynamics um, and whether those, those improve. So in conclusion, uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, ARC's made a long term bet on natural gas and the, the Montney area. The stock, stock's off considerably over the past five years, uh, given the weakened commodity price environment. But unlike a lot of their Canadian peers uh, that have moved towards a, a crude and liquids focus, uh, ARC's made a bet on natural gas. And, and it has been the weakest performer, performer of all. Base case, uh, I didn't put specific stock prices here because you're going to find it's going to be super super binary just depending on on your view and what happens but if you look at the current net back of about fifteen dollars per boe remember in, in q3 it was eleven uh, but if they get fifteen dollars times their their production that they're projecting for next year that should be enough to cover the capex and the dividends at least in the short term the bull case is obviously you've got a constructive view on natural gas the bc lng project improves the outlook and pricing. And if that were to happen, you know, FFO could, uh, funds from operations could double um, or, or better. I just highlighted back in 2014, sometimes it's easy just to look back and see what's happened in the past. So in 2014, their realized pricing per barrel of oil equivalent was over $50 and $4.76 for nat gas. And so we saw um, pricing in 2018 was just over $2 for nat gas. So it has been significantly higher in the past. And if it were to go back there, you could easily see FFO double and potentially even more than double for the share price if, if the outlook improved, right? So it, you might get multiple expansion on top of that. Bear case, um, persistent weaker prices drive continued losses. I think if that continues for some time, that 
could easily lead to a dividend cut and significant downside for shareholders. Uh, so simply, you know, if you investor in this story, there could be a ton of upside, uh, but you need to believe in a meaningful longer term nat gas recovery. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This is an interesting one. It's the first time I've actually really done a deep dive on a nat gas producer. Maybe I missed something. Let me know. Um, we'll be back soon with more content. But until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand. <laughs>